of the, the different things that we kind of believe uh, as Christians and kind of why we, we believe them uh, to be the way that they are. Uh, so last week we kind of talked a little bit about the church. Right? So last week we, we looked at uh, the church and what we should kind of be focusing on in regards to how we approach church. Uh, today I want to kind of uh, continue that sermon a, li a little bit and kind of give a little bit of a different perspective uh, on church. So last week we kind of talked about uh, where our focus should be, uh, that it should be ultimately about service to the church rather than uh, allowing the church to kind of service us. And uh, this week I want us to look more so at how God views the church and how we should be if we are going to be aligned with what God desires, and uh, a little bit more specifically, what Jesus desires. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 17. Uh, that's where we're going to be, but we're going to take a slight pause before we actually get to the, the passage. Predom well, not predominantly, but one thing that I really want to look at is ice cream. Do you guys like ice cream? No. Yeah. yeah, we got some ice cream lovers. A little bit. Last, so last year, uh, as as many of you know, I, I sub, and uh, you know, last year I was subbing at the middle school, and they had me sub as a paraprofessional. So basically, I went to different classes and kind of uh, helped with some some of the students in those classes. Last year, I was um, blessed, maybe obligated is a better term, uh, to work with the ag class, and some of I don't know anything about ag. Um, one of the classes that I got to fill in for was like the home ec kind of stuff. I don't know what they call it in this school district. We call it home ec because, you know, I'm a red blood in America. Um, so, life skills. We learned about ice cream in that class. Come on, that's far from life skill. Anyway, so we were learning about ice cream in that class, and uh, they made me like watch this documentary on ice cream and like, how ice cream was invented and the different flavors and stuff like that. Uh, so I don't know about you, but I really enjoy ice cream. For me, it's a dessert that's like super universal. Uh, do we have any chocolate fans out there? Yeah. You're a big fan of chocolate? So uh, chocolate ice cream, I thought I was doing, I never in my, my in like a million years think I'd ever be researching ice cream for a sermon, but you know, here we are. Um, it's pretty commonly believed that chocolate was like the first uh, flavor of ice cream because apparently ice cream started as a way to like freeze drinks and so uh, chocolate, coffee, that kind of stuff was the main form of, of ice cream that you would you would consume. Uh, it started from Marco Polo, right? So it's believed that our modern recipe for ice cream comes from Marco Polo and his travel to the east and he uh, got a recipe for sherbet and things you know pro progressed from there right around the 16th century and that's how we got ice cream. Any vanilla lovers? Yeah, that's my people. Uh, I am a huge fan of vanilla. For me, it's like the most universal. Take vanilla, throw it on some apple pie, we got a good dessert. Take some vanilla, throw it in a blackberry cobbler, we got some awesome dessert. Take some ice cream, put it in a bowl, uh, put some chocolate syrup on it, and we got an awesome dessert. Throw some sprinkles on it, it's super universal. Now, any strawberry, any strawberry people? There's the door. Um, I'm, just kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. If you like strawberry, we're not gonna do that. We'll just look at you funny. Um, any people who don't, they have a hard time picking which flavor they like? Neapolitan people? Yeah. You're like, I don't know which one I feel like having, I'm gonna have all of them. Um, but now it's not just enough to have vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. Now there are different, uh, versions of those things that you can get, right? So like, if vanilla's not enough, now you have homemade vanilla, French vanilla, vanilla bean, uh, birthday cake, which is sort of like an offshoot of vanilla where it's like got some cake flavor to it. Uh, not as, it it's not just enough to have chocolate ice cream. Uh, now we have chocolate brownie, we have chocolate fudge, we have uh, Dutch chocolate, chocolate cake, Rocky Road, Butter Pecan, uh, we have all these different flavors. Salted caramel. There's like 
peanut butter and chocolate like a Reese's ice cream. And now that I've talked about ice cream for way too long, um, here's my question. When did the church become ice cream? I want you to really kind of think about that. When did the church, as we know it, become like ice cream? I managed to do a little bit of research. I did a little bit of research in Bell. I believe there are, I think, maybe 12. I think there's 12 churches in Bell. Or maybe seven. It might have been seven. <laughs> What's four? You know, did I do my math right? Five. Whatever. <laughs> Clearly, I'm a sub and not the full time math. <laughs> I know. You guys would be so concerned for your kids. You'd be like, I'm never sending my kid there. <laughs> there are a handful of churches. Yes. Yeah. That's what I should have started. Yeah. There is a Lutheran church, a Christian church, a Church of Christ, Baptist church. Actually, there are two Baptist churches. There used to be two churches of Christ. There's a Methodist church. When did the church become like ice cream? Where when you look around, there's all of these different flavors. Uh, I believe there were four or five different denominations found just in Bell. That is a very small percentage of denominations worldwide. So you also have the Catholic Church, you have the Presbyterian Church, you have Freegal Baptist Church, which is like one of those, you know, nuances of your chocolate ice cream. That's like the, that's like the chocolate fudge version of the Baptist Church. We have all of these different denominations of churches, and they all have uh, very similar core beliefs, just with slightly different other beliefs, right? So, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, Church of Christ and Christian Church and Disciples of Christ, they are all an offshoot of the exact same movement that took place in uh, the 18th, 18th, 19th century, the 1800s, the 1800s, whatever century that is, uh, the 1800s. There was this movement called the Restoration Movement years ago in the 1800s, and it started as a way for uh, people to get away from denominations and start to just kind of worship God and just be Christians. Whatever walk of life you come from, whatever you believe, as long as you adhere to the key doctrines of the faith, you know, in, in Jesus, and you have faith in Jesus, you believe in the Trinity, those kinds of things, uh, you are welcome to participate in our fellowship. As time went on, even that movement became its own denomination. And now it is three denominations. When did the church become ice cream? Well, it was before the 1800s. If you really think you got Martin Luther and what, 1,500-something, who uh, branches off from the Catholic Church and starts his own sort of shindig. Is that what God had in mind? No. Like, when I, when I look out into our world and when I see uh, these different churches and these different denominations, I can't help but really just kind of be kind of cut to my core. Because when I look at this and I see... Not just that, you know, oh, well, maybe we have different beliefs, but oftentimes there's this, like, competitiveness that goes on between these churches. And when I look at what God has in mind for his church, and when I look at what Jesus himself prays for, that's not what I see. So in John chapter 17, I told you we'd be looking there. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 23 and 26. Now, Jesus has been uh, praying for people. He has been praying for himself. Uh, this is leading up to the point where Jesus is about to be betrayed and uh, lead, led to the cross and, and things like that. And he's about to be crucified. And he is kind of giving this prayer to God 
for what is going to happen next with his followers once he is gone. And so he has uh, previously prayed for the immediate 12 disciples. And now in this portion that we're going to look at, he prays for people like you and like me. He prays for those who are going to come to know who he is through the efforts of the disciples. And it says this. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one. That the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with, you, with me where I am, so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them, and will continue to make it known, so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. So Jesus is, is praying and asking these things to be done in the lives of you and in my life. There's a few, uh, there, there's a few little notes that I want to make notice of from this passage. And the first is this. We can go ahead and look at it. Jesus had the desire for his church to be unified. That was, in, in this passage, that is Jesus' main concern for his church. So when we looked at Acts and when we, we looked at some passages uh, last week, we kind of looked at the mission of the church uh, being to kind of take care of itself and to uplift one another and really kind of to pursue and encourage each other in the faith. And so that was one aspect that we looked at. But here in this passage, we have Jesus putting a huge emphasis on his church being unified. Last week we talked about how the church is the people, uh, not the building. And so this is where that kind of comes from. That you and me make up Jesus' church. And that's... That, that note is evidenced by John uh, chapter 17, verse 23-22 from Donald. And uh, I have that there. He says this, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. We should be one, not one Christian church here, and one Christian church in Bland, and one Baptist church in, uh, you know, Bell, the first, uh, the first Baptist church, and then the Liberty Baptist church, and then the Liberty Church of Christ. Uh, that's not one. One is our churches coming together to benefit this community. Amen. Last week, uh, it wasn't necessarily planned uh, when I had kind of stepped off and, you know, kind of done my thing and Mike came back up. Uh, he encouraged us to be praying for Bland Christian Church. My encouragement to you is this. Don't only pray, pray for Bland Christian Church. The truth is that the churches in this community are all working to further the kingdom of God, and we should pray for their success. And I would hope that in turn they pray for our success, that we would work together to reach the lost community of believers. Because essentially that's what Jesus says, that when, when, they, when the world, those who are lost, when they see us as the church, when they see us being unified that they would believe that God had sent Jesus. 
Now, when we look out into uh, our church and when we see all of these different denominations and this uh, competitiveness that's going on, uh, would you say that people on the outside looking in would say, well, you know, I really believe in Jesus because, you know, these people believe 8,000 different things and they can't agree. And, you know, they don't even work together. And, you know, they hope that their church grows and that the other churches fail. That doesn't sound like unity to me. And that doesn't sound like a community that I want to be a part of. And that's me as a Christian. I can't even imagine what it's like if you're on the outside looking in. You're like, I don't want any part of that. Those people don't even love the other people that claim to be Christians. There is so much division in our world. In the world as a whole, there's all this division. And within our country, we can even see a bunch of different divisions taking place. Republican versus Democrat, left versus right, woke versus, you know, not woke. I don't know. Sleep. I don't know. That's what they, I think that's the term. I don't know. And essentially, all of these different, you know, I am this, I am that has become a way that we divide and we can't find common ground and we can't have unity. It shouldn't be that way with our church. Unfortunately, it's become this thing where it's even Christian versus Christian. You know, well, you don't believe the way that we do. Well, you, you're a Baptist church, I'm a Christian church. Well, you know, you're, you're a Methodist church, you're not. You know, we, we fellowship with our people. You fellowship with, with your people. Back in the 1800s, that's exactly what was going on. That's exactly what was happening. Uh, the reason that the Christian church was originally started, and the reason that this restoration movement kind of came into place uh, was because the people who started the Christian church, their goal was that we would just fellowship with Christians. The way that church happened in the 1800s is very different than it is now. Uh, for the most part, you could kind of step into a church and uh, partake in their fellowship and things like that today. You know, if we were to go to a Baptist church, they're not going to, like, turn us away at the door and be like, we don't want you. Well, they might. I don't know. But for the most part, that's not really it. Um, in the 1800s, that's not the way it was. If you wanted to fellowship with those people, uh, you had to be baptized in their church. You had to adhere to what they believe, or else you couldn't have fellowship. And that's the division that was taking place. That is the very opposite of what Jesus had in mind when he was praying. And so the Christian church kind of started, you know, going back to this, you know, ice cream mentality. The Christian church kind of started as a way to be like a Neapolitan. Like, hey, you know, you got all these different flavors. We're going to put them all in one tub and call it good. And that was kind of the goal of the Christian church. And I'm not up here standing, you know, saying like, oh, we did it right, you know, join us because we're right. That's not the point. Um, the point is that we should be pursuing that. That regardless of your background, you should feel welcome in a church. We should work together. <laughs> and it brings me to my second point, which is this. If we can go ahead and put that up. The church's unity should be evidence of the Lord. If we cannot be unified, Jesus is essentially saying, let them be one because, Father, you and I are one. Our unity is meant to be kind of this example of the union of the Trinity. So when we look at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are all one, and we are called to be one because we are called to be an example of them. We should not be as divided as we are. We should be looking to uplift one another, regardless of what denomination they're from, regardless of what church they go to, regardless of whether or not they go to Bland or they go here, or they go to you know, Liberty Church of Christ, or they go to First Baptist, regardless of where they go, 
they should be able to lean on us for spiritual support and vice versa. I would love to see what could happen in this community if our churches work together. Not to simply grow our church's number, but to simply advance the kingdom here in Bell. The last point that I want to make is this. Sorry, Jared, I'm going to skip that verse that's in your email. The last point is this. The church's mission is to make the love of the Father known. If we can unite, if we can get the churches together and work in this community through our union and the mission of the church, we can make God's love known to those who are outside. That is the mission of the church. That final verse in John chapter 17, it really wraps up that point. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. When people look at our church, and I don't mean First Christian Church of Bell, I mean the Church of Bell, capital C. Is that the right way? You guys see that as normal C? I know I do a double C to make sure I had that right. Yes. One thing I did right as far as my math and all that good stuff goes. I got my backwards alphabet correct. When people look at the church in Bell, they should see the love of the Father being evident. Not the division and the arguments and the bickering and the fighting and the, well, we have this and we have that and you do this, but we do that. That is not what people should see when they look at the body of Christ in Belmont. They should see God's love I don't entirely know what that looks like right now. To answer Mike's question earlier of how right now, I'm not sure. But I believe that together we can figure out the answer. I believe that together we can drastically change the culture of Bell. If we would put our minds together and be unified and make the love of the Father the mission of the church, we could radically change this community. Last week, I gave you guys a, a little bit of a challenge to be thinking of ways that uh, we as a church, but also kind of you and me as an individual, ways that we could really seek to benefit this community. I would encourage you to continue to do that. November 20th, uh, we're going to be doing a meal after church, and we are going to be uh, looking at some of the ways that we can benefit our church as a community, the, the First Christian Church of Bell, but we're also going to be looking at ways that we can reach the community of Bell as a town and show them the love of the Father. My, my prayer, my challenge for you guys is this, that as we uh, get ready for November 20th to come up, which is coming up faster than you might think, we only have, what, like three, maybe four weeks? If that, be praying about ways that we as a church can not only work with our community, but work with the other churches and bring about God's kingdom here in the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you for 
your son who came to establish his church. I thank you that we can lean on each other for support. And I pray that we would be a support to those who need it. God, I pray that when, when people look at us, that they would see your love in our lives. God, that when people look at our community, when they look at our churches, and when they see how we are unified, God, that they would see a community that they want to be a part of. God, regardless of what flavor, for lack of a better word, they might want, they might desire, God, I pray that they would realize that there is a community in Bell that loves and supports them. God, I pray that we would be one, because you are one. God, we love you and we thank you. We pray all this in the name of your Son, who made all of this possible. Amen. Amen. This is the time of invitation. Uh, if you guys have any decisions, any prayers that you'd like to have lifted up, I will be uh, down front, and the, the, the band is going to come up and lead us in one final song.